the travelling fare trundled slowly down the road, with Aunt Sally sitting comfortably in the open back of the last caravan, lovingly filling her face with candy floss. She seemed blissfully unaware that a panting, sweating Wurzel Gummidge was pedalling furiously away on the crowman's tricycle, trying valiantly to catch up with her and the travelling fare. Wurzel, too, was unaware that at that very moment the crowman was trudging along the dusty road in his wake, determined to get both Wurzel and his tricycle back again. The fare eventually stopped at Lower Steepleton, and Wurzel and Aunt Sally were taken on as casual labourers. Wurzel, to his disgust, had to fetch heavy barrels of coconuts. This wasn't really his line. In fact, it made rook scaring seem like taking a holiday. Completely out of breath, he dumped one down by Aunt Sally and rested his tired body on the grass. Oh, my aching twigs and straw, he grunted. I'll be bum swizzled if I don't have a bit of a sit down and a bit of a rest. It was then he noticed Aunt Sally's toffee smeared face. And even as he watched, she swallowed one toffee apple and started on another. My, my, my! <laughs> Aunt Sally and toffee apples! Taffy apples and Aunt Sally. Here, you goes together like sausages and cream cake. Wurzel could see that she was pleased at the compliment, despite her scowl. Here, that's a nice pretty bonnet you'm wearing. In fact, that's the nicest prettiest bonnet I've ever seen, he said ingratiatingly. Aunt Sally managed a toffee apple-filled. Thank you. So give us a taffy apple then, before I jumps up and down on it. Aunt Sally gulped down the rest of the toffee apple quickly. Certainly not. These ain't for eating, they're for selling. And so saying, she took another. Then why for have you had a taffy apple when I ain't? Aunt Sally hiccuped loudly. <gasps> Who says I have? Well, complained Wurzel. It's obvious, because you've got taffy all round your mouth. You looks like a taffy apple. For your fermentation, said Aunt Sally haughtily, I have been a doing of my job, dipping the toffee apples. <gasps> Can I help it if I dip my head in the toffee bucket? Wurzel smiled at her lovingly. I'll tell you what, Aunt Sally, when we's done our day's work and got our wages, how'd you like me to buy you a cup of tea and slice of cake? Perhaps, said Aunt Sally. <gasps> she was slowly turning a pale green colour. Oh, then again, perhaps not, and she hurried away. Meanwhile, far away, an exhausted crow man, hot and dusty, stopped to look at a signpost. The news was depressing. The signpost said, Lower Steepleton, 18 miles. The crow man mopped his brow with a large coloured handkerchief and trudged on. Whilst the crow man was trudging up the dusty country roads, Aunt Sally was arranging the toffee apples on their stand, with a surreptitious lick here and another one there. Well, that is, until the door of a neighbouring caravan opened and out stepped the strong man. What a fine figure he presented, with brilliantined hair, a splendid waxed moustache, teeth gleaming as much as his hair, and practising dumbbell exercises in his leopard-skin costume. Admiration shone in Aunt Sally's eyes, and her eyelids fluttered like excited butterflies. The strong man wasn't slow to notice this, and he bared his white teeth in a smile, flexed his muscles, and winked a large, coarse wink. With elephantine coyness, Aunt Sally demurely lowered her eyes. It was now that Wurzel, wheezing like a concertina, staggered up and deposited yet another large barrel of coconuts on the toffee apple stall, in a state of near exhaustion. Aunt Sally looked upon this interruption of her flirtation with the strong man with haughty displeasure. Well, what do you want now? she demanded impatiently. Take them coconuts away. They bring back unhappy memories. Well, in a jiffy, Wurzel puffed, I've just got to have a breather. Always breathing, you are, scoffed Aunt Sally. Breathe, breathe, breathe. Go away and breathe somewhere else. She gave the strong man a coy smile. Well, what, what's wrong with breathing if the body wants to, protested Wurzel. Anyway, you're breathing. No, I'm not. Breathing's common. I can see you breathing, insisted Wurzel. Breathing with your eyes. Aunt Sally was highly amused at this. Breathing with my eyes, she sneered. Don't be so preposterous. My dear ignorant scarecrow, for your fermentation, what you can see me doing is flattering my pretty eyelids. Again she fluttered her eyelids coquettishly at the strong man, who, watched by a jealous Wurzel, reflexed his muscles and showed his teeth in a blinding smile. 
Smugly, Aunt Sally waved a toffee apple on a stick in front of her face, as she would have used a fan. The fact that the apple fell off, leaving the stick as the fan, she preferred not to notice. The strong man then responded to this with a short but spectacular display with his dumbbells. Wurzel scowled. Here, yeah, why for you flitter fluttering it in? Because he's big and strong, and has a shiny head, and a wax moustache, and a caravan. Also, he's a great. Wurzel was impressed, but puzzled. Ah, a, a, a great, is he? What's a great? Aunt Sally smiled pityingly. Don't you know nothing about nothing, you stupid turnip? It's his title, the great Orlando. The strong man struck a pose and extended a flamboyant hand in the direction of a placard by his caravan, which read, The Great Orlando. It's the same as being the Duke of Clarence, she explained, only better. And, of course, whomever marries him will become Lady Great Orlando. Well, yeah, well, that may be so, Aunt Sally, but there's something you don't seem to realise. What would be in by me, see? And what don't I realise, pray? Well, said Wurzel, lowering his voice to a delicate whisper, he's a human. And what of it? asked Aunt Sally. Well, said Wurzel, scandalised, you, you can't go flitter-fluttering your eyes at a human. Aunt Sally was being difficult. Fiddle-faddle, whom says so? His iron mightiness the crow man, that's so. Aunt Sally tittered. <laughs> oh, perhaps we should send for him then. And when he's explanated why I shouldn't flutter my pretty eyes at the great Orlando, though for the life of me I don't know why I shouldn't, you can explain why you pinched his wheelie thing. Wurzel shifted from one foot to the other. Yeah, well, um, I think I'll get some shifting his ear cookie nuts, he finished hastily, and he bent down to pick up the barrel again. Aunt Sally and the strong man watched with sly smiles on their faces as Wurzel wrapped his arms round the barrel and heaved. Their smiles grew even wider, as the more Wurzel heaved, the more firmly the barrel seemed to remain rooted to the ground. Wurzel's face took on a purple hue until he seemed about to pass out. Boy, oh, dang things, he said. They seem to have taken root. Here, come on, give us an hand, Aunt Sally. Certainly not, she replied scornfully. I'm far too weak and delicate. It was then, with a nonchalant smile, and a flash of his teeth at Aunt Sally, that the strong man stepped forward. He breathed in and out a few times, leaned over the barrel easily, and as if he was picking up a cardboard box, lifted it up onto his head without the slightest difficulty or even effort. Aunt Sally's look of scorn turned to one of sheer worship, as the strong man smiled, and oh, it was nothing smile. Um, uh, uh, thank you very much, great said Wurzel. I, I, I could have done that myself, only I strained me head. Aunt Sally clasped her hands together in rapture as the strong man moved off with a barrel of coconuts. Oh, so strong and silent, she whispered, her eyes shining. Well, that's what he gets his wages for, isn't it? said Wurzel with a look of envy. Here, and talking about getting wages, how about that cup of tea and a slice of cake we was going to have, Aunt Sally? There was no answer. Aunt Sally, still gazing after the strong man, hadn't heard a word. Yet that woman with the beard says there's a nice tea shop in the village where they sell the lovely different kinds of cakes, he continued. Aunt Sally suddenly returned to reality at the sound of the magic word cake. Uh, what's that? A cake? Oh, oh, very well. Meet me outside the fortune teller's booth when the big hand of the church clock is halfway up and the little hand is halfway down. Wurzel nodded happily. Half past twenty-two. I'll be there, Aunt Sally. I'll be there. And all the while, the crow man was gradually getting nearer and nearer. At the agreed time, Wurzel, holding a bunch of flowers in his hand for Aunt Sally, paced impatiently up and down outside the fortune teller's booth, waiting for her to arrive. Suddenly his face lit up, as he saw Aunt Sally emerge from the booth, only to fall immediately when the strong man, wearing his best suit, bowler hat, celluloid collar and diamond tie pin, emerged with her. Sadly, knowing that he was on a loser, but prepared to try his luck, Wurzel approached them. Uh, 
Half past twenty-two, Aunt Sally, he said, hopefully. Aunt Sally was at her ladylike best. What about it, my man? Tea time, said Wurzel simply. Superciliously, Aunt Sally turned to the strong man, who gave Wurzel a winner's smile, all teeth and confidence. Wurzel's heart sank. Uh, excuse me, said Aunt Sally to the strong man. This a poor man wants a penny for a cup of tea and a slice of bread and butter. But the strong man, still flashing his teeth as if they were the crown jewels, reached inside his check waistcoat with a flourish, took out a coin, and flipped it contemptuously to Wurzel, who automatically caught it in his hat like a beggar would. He then smiled at Aunt Sally, flashed his teeth, and smiled again as Aunt Sally flickered her eyelids at him. Wurzel's blood would have boiled if he'd had any. Aunt Sally, too, didn't intend to spare Wurzel's feelings. I've just had my fortune told. She says I'm to marry a strong, silent man with a shiny head and live off chocolates for the rest of my life. And then, dismissing Wurzel with a wave of her hand, she turned to the strong man. Shall we? she asked. The strong man gave Wurzel a sneer, smiled at Aunt Sally, raised his hat and crooked his arm. Gazing into his eyes, Aunt Sally placed her arm through his, and they left Wurzel staring miserably after them, his lips quivering with a mixture of hurt and lost pride. Then, suddenly, Wurzel's look of pain swiftly vanished to be replaced by a crafty leer. Quickly he went across to the barrel of coconuts and selected a large, nicely weighted one. And then he took accurate and deliberate aim at the back of the strong man's departing head. Wurzel was in luck. As Aunt Sally and the strong man walked arm in arm across the fairground, along came the owner from the opposite direction. Ever polite, the strong man raised his hat and smiled. As the bowler hat left his head, Wurzel knew that this chance was too good to miss, and let fly the coconut with every ounce of his strength. His aim was good. The coconut soared through the air at the rate of knots, and just before the strong man's bowler hat returned to base, the coconut struck him on the back of his head with a resounding thwack. But Wurzel's gleeful chuckle died in his throat. As the coconut rebounded onto the grass, the strong man replaced his hat and walked on, flashing his teeth as if nothing had happened. Wurzel was demolished. Drooping flowers in his hand and gloom disfiguring his face, he trudged off. Ah, win a few, lose a few, he thought. But with Aunt Sally, it always seemed to be, lose a few, lose a few. Silence being the strong man's second best achievement, his strength being the first, with intelligence running a bad third, he was quite content to let Aunt Sally do all the talking as they trudged down the lane towards the village. And talk she did. And, of course, when I say that I've always worked in the fair, I don't mean anything common like having wooden balls chucked at me, Ed. I mean, I've always been one of the knobs. Uh, do you know Romania at all? Oh, the royal family are quite charming. Had us to tea they did three times a day. It was then that Aunt Sally halted midway through her monologue and stared at the garden of a cottage overlooking the lane. In the garden stood a most unusual scarecrow, made not from straw but plastic, she was dressed in a slightly dated cocktail dress and looked almost like a shop window dummy on display. Aunt Sally stared at her with dislike. Oh, that's even a scarecrow in a garden this size. Of course, it's not a proper scarecrow. Anyone can see that. As Aunt Sally and the strong man went on down the lane, from inside the plastic scarecrow came an amused and very feminine giggle, which turned into another giggle as the disconsolate Wurzel, still carrying his bunch of flowers, shambled past. Wurzel heard the giggle and stopped. He looked up at the scarecrow very suspiciously. Was you sniggering and smiggering at then? There was no reply. He tried again, this time in Wurzelese, to ask her if she was a scarecrow. He were over he were dip, I were rest for dip, why were over you were dip, I were dip, as for see where I were over he were see where I were over double result. There was still no reply and Wurzel began to get annoyed. Ah, oh, I suppose you're too grand and I'm mighty to answer with your fine ways and, and, and your fine clothes. Another giggle came from the interior of the scarecrow. Wurzel looked fiercer than ever. Look, I'm asking you nice and polite for the last time. 
Is you a scarecrow? He snapped. At this, the scarecrow came to life. That's right, mate, she said in pure rag trade cockney. Well, mash up me head with salt and pepper. Why didn't you say so in the first place? Well, cause she was talking in words of ease. He never learnt me no words of ease, a crow man, never just yakety. Then, without any warning, she flung out her arms, arched her back, and stretched out her legs. Wurzel, to say the least, was intrigued. Yeah, what'd you do that for? She giggled. <laughs> Force of habit. Cause I'm a model, see? Wurzel had often wondered what a model was, or, in his own words, a mogul. But the scarecrow explained it to him. Well, they put you in a shop window with a frock on, she said. I have a so grand at this, in Bond Street, up west. Wurzel boggled. Uh, uh, up west? That's where the sun sets, in it? Oh, many, many a time I said to myself, I'll go up west and see where that sun goes to over night time. But you know, Missy, I I've never catched up with it. The scarecrow giggled again. Oh, how oh, you do make me laugh, you do. Wurzel smiled shyly and gave a crinkly grin. Yeah, I, I can see I do. Well, why is that then? Well, because you're funny. Am I really? Yeah, of course you are, she said. She giggled again. Hey, you make me laugh. And she kept on giggling. Here, yeah, said Wurzel, very flattered. When you've finished the, the giggling, giggling and laughing, do you like cups of tea and slices of cake? She shrugged. I don't know, mate. I ain't never had none. Wurzel was astounded. Where'd she been living? Never had a cup of tea and a slice of cake. What with being a model, see? You've got to keep thin. Well, said Wurzel, you ain't a muggle now, you're a scarecrow, so I'm going to take you for a nice cup of tea and all the slices of cake a body can eat. She smiled. It was a nice, sincere smile. Oh, you are kind. Here, what's your name? Wurzel removed his hat bashfully. Ah, uh, Wurzel, he said, slightly embarrassed. And um, Wurzel Gomez. And mine, she said. It's Dolly Clovespeck. The village tea shop, licensed to sell cups of tea and slices of cake, was very nearly full. Aunt Sally and the strong man were sitting at a table by the window in which was displayed an array of gatto. From the cream around her mouth, the empty plate in front of her, plus an attack of hiccups, it was evident that Aunt Sally had enjoyed a substantial tea. The strong man, however, was still ploughing his way through an enormous mound of sausages, eggs, chips and bread and butter, his rhythmical chomping lending a background atmosphere to Aunt Sally's never-ending chatter. I must say, she said with a loud hiccup, I do like to see a man with a proper appetite. Personally, I eat like a sparrow. In fact, may doctors say they don't understand how I can keep going. But of course, we ladies don't have to keep up our strength the same as what you gentlemen do. Her prattling suddenly faded as she saw Wurzel and Dolly Clothespeg enter the tea shop, smiling and chatting. Immediately her mouth set in a firm, hard line. Pretending not to listen, her ears were primed to catch each word they uttered. Dolly looked around in wonder. Here, yeah, in this nice Wurzel, Aunt Sally heard her say. Oh, here, yeah, can we have one of them cream cakes? Wurzel smiled generously. One of them? Hey, <laughs> you don't want no one of them, my dear. You want all of them. Sit you down. Well, 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 said Aunt Sally loudly. Look what the cat's dragged in. Hey, Massé, she looks as if he bought her in a jumble sale. She seethed as she watched Wurzel share out the plate of cakes the waitress brought him. Hey, hey, our dolly clothes, big. As, as three for me and, and three for you. Dolly giggled. Hey, <laughs> silly. This ain't free. This is four. And you got two. There. She placed another cake on Wurzel's plate. Now we've got half each, haven't we? Wurzel blinked. It ain't two and four the same as three, then. Course not. Who's been telling you that? With that there Aunt Sally. I'll knock her head off, so I will. Well, Aunt Sally's my intended. I saw her sitting over there. Dolly Clothespeg felt sad at hearing that. But Wurzel's intended Aunt Sally 
was almost spitting with rage and jealousy, especially when she saw them holding hands. <laughs> Look at them! Like a couple of flippin' lovebirds, she screamed at the strong man, who was more intent on his sausages than he was on Aunt Sally. Dolly leaned over to Wurzel. Yeah, ain't she pretty? Lovely colouring. Her voice was sad. But if by any chance it turns out that Aunt Sally don't want to marry you, yeah? or it might be somebody else, what does? It was at this moment that a well-aimed gatto from Aunt Sally landed squarely in Dolly's face. Dolly turned to Wurzel as she slowly wiped the cream from her eyes. Without a word, Wurzel picked up a huge cream cake from a nearby trolley and handed it to Dolly. Dolly took careful aim and fired. As Aunt Sally wiped the cream cake from her face and picked up another gatto, the crow man was talking to a Mr. James, owner of the garden abode of Dolly Clothespeck. As I recall, sir, said the crow man, grim-faced, you didn't want a scarecrow, oh dear me no, because you already had one. A dressmaker's dummy, I believe. I see she's walked. Walked? queried Mr. James, baffled. How the public take them, explained the crow man. Uh, souvenirs, you understand. Mr. James shook his head. Ah, oh, I should have had a proper scarecrow, I suppose. Ah, that you should, sir, said the crow man. As it happens, I, I have one ready-made. Yours for a song, sir. Mr. James hesitated. Uh, it won't vanish like the other. The crow man smiled a wintry smile. Not when I've done with it, sir. Not when I've done with it. After eluding the angry management of the tea shop, a cream bespattered Wurzel and Dolly Clothespeg reached the safety of the fairground. Ah, oh, me, oh, my Wurzel, said Dolly. What a day and no mistake. Oh, it's not had so much fun since my boss stuck his trousers to be awning board. Wurzel's face creased into a grin. And I's not had so much fun, never. Fact is, I didn't ever know what fun was till I met you, Dolly. Ah, oh, well, said Dolly reluctantly. I suppose I'd better get back and scare a few crows, eh? Well, why for you want to go and do that, Dolly? She shrugged. Don't know. It's my job, I suppose. Yeah, well, it's my job and all, said Wurzel. You don't catch Wurzel scaring crows no more. He scratched his head. Here, Dolly, why for don't you come and work in the fair, same as me, and then we could have some more fun, eh? Dolly smiled wistfully. Oh, I'd like that, Wurzel, she said. Really, I would. But where would I live? Wurzel chuckled. In the caravan, Dolly, same as all of us. Now then, let's see. He looked around and saw the perfect caravan for Dolly. Yeah, there's a nice caravan, he said, and nobody lives in it except the tattooed man, and he's in hospital with blood poisoning. Step this way, Dolly. As Wurzel took Dolly Clothespeg into the caravan, Aunt Sally and the strong man reached the door of the strong man's caravan. Uh, thank you so much for a pleasant afternoon, smiled Aunt Sally graciously. We must take tea again when there ain't so many ignorant amuses about. The strong man flashed his teeth and raised his bowler hat, and Aunt Sally extended her hand for him to kiss it. She waited, and still waited. But the strong man's attention was elsewhere attracted, towards the fat lady's caravan. To Aunt Sally's utter disgust, the fat lady simpered and waved a podgy hand at the strong man and called, here, a care for a cup of tea and some cream cakes. Apparently, the strong man did care, because in two minutes, he and the fat lady had disappeared inside her caravan, leaving Aunt Sally abandoned once more. It was then she heard laughter coming from the tattooed man's caravan. And tightening her lips in a hard, vicious line, Aunt Sally put her ear to the wall and listened to Wurzel and Dolly. She hadn't been listening for long, when she was suddenly confronted by an angry fairground owner who wanted to know why she wasn't on the toffee apple stall. Aunt Sally curtsied. Eh, I was just coming to look for you, sir, she said, and told him that she thought the coconut shy would do better business if he had a genuine Aunt Sally. There was one in the tattooed man's caravan, she said. The owner gasped. Uh, a genuine one? Well, she said, not a genuine one, sir. Quite a common one, really, but good enough to chuck balls at. 
she took him into the tattooed man's caravan and pointed to Dolly Clothes Peg, who immediately became a scarecrow again. Wurzel didn't need to, because he was already employed in the fair as a human. Uh, that's the Aunt Sally what I spoke of, Mr. Fairground Owner, sir, she said. The owner nodded. Yeah, yeah, it has possibilities. Definitely possibilities. Ten minutes later, a sad and miserable Wurzel, having been sacked, approached the crowman's tricycle. But before he could ride it away, a familiar figure emerged from the shadows. Wurzel shivered. It was the crowman himself. I'm uh, not going to throw you on the compost heap, Wurzel. You deserve it. But I found you a little job to do in a little garden where a certain scarecrow has deserted her post. Wurzel knew that he meant Dolly Clothespeg. But before he started his new job, he told the crow man that he'd like to say goodbye to Aunt Sally and to Dolly Clothespeg. After all, they might like to come with him. Poor Dolly Clothespeg. There she was in the coconut shy, being pelted with wooden balls by Aunt Sally. Wurzel was horrified. Why should Aunt Sally want to do that? Jealousy, Wurzel, said the crow man. She didn't want Dolly to have you. Wurzel brightened. If that was true, it must be because Aunt Sally loved him and wanted to marry him. Uh, can I, can I ask her your exceptionalness? He asked the crow man. The crow man sighed. Go along, Wurzel. But you'll never learn. Yes, Wurzel asked her all right, and Aunt Sally laughed, and the fat lady laughed, and the strong man laughed, and everyone laughed, except Dolly Clothespeg. The crow man put his arm around Wurzel's shoulders affectionately. All right, come along now, Wurzel, back to Scatterbrook. <laughs>